I heard that Robert Schock was forming Oracle, uh, the organization on the research of ancient cultures, and I uh, really love Robert Schock's work with the Sphinx and dating the Sphinx and, and using that geological approach and his background to determine that the Sphinx was much older than we think. And that is very intriguing to me. And so I wanted to be involved with Oracle and provide any kind of assistance that I can as an archeologist to help sort of supplement the geology and really validate some of these older sites by having that, that hard evidence that the, the skeptical archeologists, the old school archeologists are looking for and they're gonna tear it apart if they don't have that. So I want them to be able to hold on to something that says, look, this, is, this was here, this was found, we have dates, we have the geology to prove all of this and so I wanted to be involved and they had some really great project ideas and it got me really excited about this and, and I wanted to meet the team and come to Egypt with Robert Shock and see these sites for myself, see the Sphinx, see what he's talking about and get a perspective uh, of being here because this to me has always been a dream, you know, to be in Egypt. Even though I don't have a background in Egyptology and it's still very foreign to me, uh, it's something as a kid, you know, you see the pyramids, you see the Sphinx, you see these great temples and you just want to be here and experience for yourself. So that's why I wanted to come with Shock, with the whole team and just uh, experience it and, you know, see the story. One of my favorite spots, and it's not even something I knew about, is the Seraphium. It's just this massive underground chamber with these uh, cut out mini chambers where you have these gigantic blocks of uh, they're basically boxes I mean I don't even know what they were used for they're, it's definitely not a crypt it doesn't seem like tombs there's just these massive boxes that are empty they were found empty and so it's puzzling I mean I, I don't have an idea of what was going on there I could speculate on a million different things but it's definitely something that feels out of time. It feels out of place. It feels like an anomaly. Everything else, it definitely seems like, you know, you can kind of explain it. Uh, there are certain things you can explain. Some of the construction methods, some of the, the practices that were in place, definitely a lot of the, the information that's encoded on these walls through the hieroglyphics, definitely some of the, the ceremonial practices, the religious beliefs. There's a lot of mystery to that still, uh, but you can definitely get a sense that there was something else going on that we just don't understand. Well, I think the paradigm is definitely shifting, you know, as this older generation of archeologists, the ones that have clung to the theory that Clovis were the first people into North America and the only people to migrate into North America. And, you know, they're, it's the Clovis first theory. And that's what you read in the textbooks. And that's what's been sort of disseminated for so long. And now you have this uh, not only younger generation, but more people that are questioning, well, why why the Clovis first? Why wouldn't there be anybody before? And so they're going back to these sites and digging deeper, and they're finding, okay, well, there were people here before. And I think that opens up, um, you know, as the younger generation moves into archeology span and, and, and the technology improves, and there's different ways of kind of looking at things other than the traditional way that we've been doing archeology span for a hundred years. It opens the doors to new avenues of exploration, you know, using LIDAR, using drones, using uh, underwater submersible cameras and, and robotics to check things that have been, you know, submerged for however many thousands of years. And so that sparks a new interest in this younger generation who are already questioning everything that's around them. I mean, whether it's uh, government influence or uh, elections, and, you know, all of the crazy stuff that's going on right now. Everybody is questioning things and they want answers and they want to use whatever resources they can to find those answers. And so you, the more resources you have, the better opportunity you have to get those answers that you're seeking. So I think that's that's the paradigm shift now is that technology, we've embraced it so much. And yes, it's a double edged sword because if we become too reliant on it, then, you know, we lose the basic skills that we've been brought up with. And that includes archaeology. I mean, there's a basic set of skills to be an archaeologist. and. A lot of that is field work and research and analysis, and that takes time. Now with the internet and just the accessibility of things, it's it's great, but it can also kind of make us lazy in a sense, and we're not really doing our homework, and we're kind of junk, jumping to conclusions quicker. And I think that's why the older generation is more prone to poke holes in a lot of these new uh, discoveries and sites and claims of older sites, because they want the evidence to back it up and they want that evidence to be retested again and again to make sure that the 
results are the same and it's consistent. And now that that's happening and these sites are being tested continuously and the dates keep coming back older, they have to finally you know concede that, okay, Clovis weren't the first people. So it's a cool shift. And I think you know, archeology span is uh, definitely romanticized uh, and there's not a lot of money in archeology. span So there aren't that many people going into it but I think because of technology and because of the accessibility of a lot of these things, it's, it's intriguing to people because they can kind of help rewrite the history books and uh, put a new spin on history that has felt kind of stagnant for a while. And uh, we definitely need a, a resurgence of, of information that we're you know, teaching our kids and teaching the younger generation. I mean, me growing up, we spent maybe a week on Native American culture in school. And it's only when Europeans came and made contact, and that's all we learned about. We learned about the decimation of an entire culture, and that's it, and then we move on, and then we focus on government politics and wars, and it's like, it's so negative. You have 10,000 plus years of history and culture, and we barely scratched the surface of that. So there needs to be a change. There needs to be more that we can teach kids and the younger generation about who we are as humans, the human story. It's a lot longer than we think it is. You know? When we're talking about the Clovers, we're talking about the, the, the group of people that are typically dated to that period that are, have been considered a long time by the archeological communities being the first people into North America to migrate into North America. And that's based on the fact that they found these fluted arrow point or spear points that uh, were unique to this group. They found them in Clovis, New Mexico. And so that's how the Clovis name came about. And so for a long time, it was assumed that the Clovis people came from Asia, across the Bering Strait, across Beringia, that the landmass was connected from uh, Russia over to Alaska. And then they came through this ice-free corridor down into North America, and then they settled from there. But as we learned, that's not necessarily the case because you know we're starting to find sites that predate the Clovis. So that means that there were earlier migrations into North America, uh, going back as far as well down in Monte Verde, sixty thousand years, and it just keeps getting older. So you know, you look at other places in the world and just the migration of people there, the you know the presence of different hominid species, and just the antiquity of some of these sites. And you look at North America and it seems relatively young and, and new and, and there have been a lot of people here and it doesn't make sense. I mean, if you look at the level of sophistication of uh, uh, seafaring communities, I mean, obviously traveling through open waters uh, was very important going back to Homo habilis. I mean, there's ev evidence in the Mediterranean that they were sailing 500,000 years ago. So that means that seafaring is only gonna get better as you continue to do it. And uh, using the stars to navigate was obviously a common practice as we've seen from Polynesian expansion. So it only makes sense that there would have been coastal migrations, uh, land migrations, and probably multiple migrations over a long period of time. So far what we know is that modern humans have been around for 250,000 years, right? But that date keeps getting pushed back. Uh, these modern humans coexisted with other humans. I don't wanna call them subhumans, but they were another branch of the human tree. Uh, the Neanderthals, the Denisovans, Homo erectus. So we had interactions with these other uh, beings and we obviously mingled and bred with them as it's in the genetic evidence. I mean, we all have bits of Neanderthal DNA. So clearly there was a lot going on between that 250,000 period, year period and you know up until let's say 10,000 years ago when civilization starts. But that's a long period of time to just be sitting around in caves and banging rocks together. So clearly there was uh, some sort of cultural exchange between these groups. You see it in the art, you see it in the practices, and there is a higher level of sophistication among some of these other species. And we're learning that more with the evidence from Denisova Cave, uh, the, the continual you know, discovery of these Neanderthal sites with this beautiful material culture, uh, the burial practices that you know 
predate human burials, the idea of, of burying uh, the dead with grave goods, you know, having some reverence for the dead. And uh, musical instruments, you know, stuff made out of uh, mammoth bone, flutes, uh, jewelry. I mean, so clearly these, these other non-human humans were uh, not just a bunch of half ape men, you know, running around, you know, clubbing each other to death. So, and that's, that was a narrative that was told for so long. And now we're starting to realize that, well, maybe these people weren't as uh, dumb as we think they are. And maybe they were actually quite intelligent. Maybe they had abilities that, you know, we humans either inherited from them or that we didn't, we didn't have the chance to inherit. And so we lost that information. We lost those skills. And so eventually, you know, these other species, I don't know if I necessarily agree that they went extinct. I think it just became an admixture of genetics. I mean, I think eventually, you know, eventually purebred Native Americans are not gonna go extinct, but because of the mixture of, of uh, different races and, and different genetics, it kind of just merges together. And so eventually we, Homo sapiens, became the, the dominant species. And uh, there was a point where we, I think, reached a certain level of, um, I don't know, advancement. And that's kind of this mysterious uh, air, gray area that nobody's quite sure what happened. Um, you know, there's the Neolithic, the idea of the Neolithic revolution that 30,000 years ago, this all of a sudden we were doing these beautiful cave paintings in France and, and we had this high level of art and this connection, this deep understanding of the cosmos. And there seems to be some sort of deity worship between animal natures and like, you know, the Venus figures, the, the pregnant woman, the feminine power. So there was all of this that kind of blew up from out of nowhere. And then everything kind of goes silent again for a while and then, you know, then it's not conventionally until 3,000 years ago that civilization reemerges again with Sumeria and Egypt. But then there's that kind of dark age period where we're not sure what happens. And uh, now we know that there was things happening and we have Gobekli Tepe and we have this site that was very sophisticated and was purposely buried. And the dates to, you know, 10, 11, maybe even older. I mean, we can only date when it was purposely buried, but that site may have been there for 20,000 years. So that's the story as we know it. And it's a long story, but there's so many gaps that we are just now beginning to put little pieces together, but there's still so many pieces that are missing and there's so many pieces that we'll never find. Thank you.